Hello friends and welcome to the City of the Immaculata, a channel where we discuss history and theology. I'd ask that you hit the like button if you enjoy this material and if you haven't already, subscribe or share it with others. Today we're looking at the Irish Book of Kells, the greatest manuscript of the Middle Ages. Now, I am as given to hyperbole as the next person, admittedly, but I think, at least maybe by the end of this, you might be tempted to agree if you're not already familiar with the Book of Kells. It's one of these, it's one of these areas of study that almost defies definition, that defies explanation. It's got an almost otherworldly sense to it. And keeping with the general theme of this channel, I like to find areas of interest that you don't hear about as commonly in the Catholic discourse. And while my channel is small, and I appreciate everybody that watches, that comments, and that views the videos, I want to, in my own small way, to bring light to certain subjects that get overlooked. And this one in particular, as a student of medieval history and theology, is one that I wish I could shine the brightest light as possible onto. And hopefully I will be able to do it some justice. Though, as you're going to find out, Pulling images from the Book of Kells, I found that there's two options that I have. One type of image seems to get the vibrancy of color, but really seems to miss the details, as example in the picture on the left. The other while it seems to get the details, tends to dull the colors in the process, as you can see with the picture on the right. So throughout, I picked examples of both because as with any lecture on art, there really is no substitute for the real thing. And it's the lecturer's job to as best as possible to bring life to the subject matter. And there really is just two very key elements to this particular work. One is the color. Two is the just level of intricacy and detail. And unfortunately for some pictures, I have to sacrifice one or the other because that just seems to be the nature of the pictures. I also am just using this particular slide here, these two images, because I wanna right from the start, bring your attention right away to the almost without equal level of intricacy the Book of Kells displays. I may call your attention here or there throughout this slide to specifics, but overall you will need to make your own journey into this work because unfortunately these slides just will not do justice to how incredible this document really is. For that, you must go to the place itself. Fortunately, you can visit the real thing and see for yourself, which is in Dublin, Ireland at the old library in Trinity College. If you happen to find yourself in the great city of Dublin, Ireland, please make sure to put it on your itinerary list to visit Trinity College, to visit the old library, and to go see the, the splendor of this medieval document. So as usual here, I'm going to give you just a little bit of background. And the first part of the background we have to just at least touch upon here is the subject of Celtic monasticism. Celtic is one of those words that seems to transcend definition, much like the Book of Kells does. Uh, people seem to want to make of it what they, 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 they put back into it what they want it to be, yet it is actually something specific and unique. And though it is unique, and though in its own way, Ireland in this period was somewhat isolated, 
it's not totally insular as you may think it would be. Just for example, the the Irish Celtic monastics had a deep love for the Eastern Desert monasticism. They saw it as something of an ideal, which is somewhat unique because on the mainland continent, the dominant form of monasticism was the Benedictine form. And while the Benedictine form certainly had its roots in the desert monasticism, it never quite saw the desert style of monasticism as an ideal, much in the way that the Celtic monastics do. And there's an interesting history about how the desert monastics worked its way up to Ireland. I mean, just for example, we have examples of Celtic crosses. I'm sure you're all familiar with the Celtic cross. Well, certain Celtic crosses have images embedded within the cross. And there's at least several of these that have icons within the Celtic cross of St. Anthony of the Desert, which is a very unique thing because St. Anthony of the Desert, while he was very influential in the East, was not a um, popularly venerated saint on continental Europe, whereas it was, he was in Ireland. We think maybe the, the, the sea trade routes up across modern day Portugal and up and through Ireland, there may have been something of a cross-pollinization going on there. Now, despite the fact that certain people want to impose upon Celtic identity, Celtic Christianity, what they see as, I mean, gosh, I've seen everything from Eastern Orthodox claiming Celtic identity. I have seen New Age hippie evangelists claiming Celtic identity. Strictly speaking, though, Celtic identity was identified by some things that aren't maybe as romantic as some people would like to make it to be. Just a few things, though, they're identified by their dating of Easter. They used a um, dating scheme that was different than what the, the Roman calendar used. They had a very specific monastic tonsure, that is the shaving of the top of the head, which was its own um, distinct from the Benedictine tonsures. They also had their own unique way of doing the sacrament of penance, which was because at, at the time, the, the, the confession, the sacrament of confession was done publicly, whereas the Celtic monastics and their um, infinite wisdom decided that maybe private penance, private confession was actually a better idea. So this is where that tradition started from. As well, they have a very rich intellectual tradition. The, the Celtic monastics were, um, were just almost, I would say, I guess, try, trying to impose a word like famous on the medieval word can be, world can be a little challenging sometimes. But certain of them were very well known throughout Christendom for their learned and for their theology, just for example, uh, a say, famous one in his day was John Donne's Irigina, who was brought from Ireland um, and brought into the um, Carolingian court because Charlemagne, with his Carolingian Renaissance, wanted to bring the greatest minds into his court. And of course, he brought Irigina, who was one of the most famous in his day. Now, like much of this early pre pre-printing press, um, society that of, of this early Christianity that viewed the transcription of sacred scripture as a meditative otherworldly process of both creating scripture and of reading scripture. And it's within this context that these monks give us what we are talking about today. And so what exactly is the Book of Kells? Well, it's a manuscript of Latin Gospels from the 7th to the 9th century, roughly, though dates and origins have long been argued. Uh, the um, origins of it seem to come from, seem to at least have a connection with the island of Iona off the western um, coast of Scotland. We know by roughly the year 807, it was brought to Kells in Ireland uh, to avoid Viking raids. 
and from there it gets its name, the Book of Kells. We know at the very least we can accurately pinpoint it to um, being in Kells by the 12th century um, because they started to use some of the pages to record property transactions. So dating and placing it is a little bit challenging, but that's what we know. Um, Apocryphal legend has it that St. Um, Columcill was involved in drafting some of the pages. It may even have been one of the artists. It uh, primarily uses the Vulgate, Jerome's Latin Vulgate, with some of the old Latin translation um, usage as well. The, the text itself is decorated in an elaborate, rich, what's known as an insular majuscule with, a large, with large Celtic iconographic images interlaced. Now, it's also not certain what its exact uses, what its exact use or uses were. It possibly served as a liturgical um, device with its long sections of sacred scripture, as well as its um, periscopes, which are um, pericopes rather, which are the short passages of scripture used for public reading. It also may have been given, you know, a certain layered significance where the images on the page may allow the reader to view the passages in several different lights, allegorically, analogically, anagogically, um, literally, so on and so forth. Now, obviously, it had a prayerful, meditative quality to it, but it's a challenge because we don't have any reference to why the book was produced in the first place. You know, it may, it may be it filled a preconceived need, or maybe it was just making use of the talents of certain artistic monks who were at hand at the monastery. Strictly speaking, we do not have any extant literature on what exactly the Book of Kells was used for, so historians have been left to conjecture. But now we're going to take some time and look at the individual pages itself. And again, I just invite you, you know, if you're, if I move through some of these too fast to just pause or to go search these images out yourself. Here we have an example, because in the Book of Kells, we often get cover pages before you move on to the um, written text. The cover pages that would be um, intended to accompany succeeding pages of scripture. Um, unfortunately, the Book of Kells was never finished, and the pages have been shuffled and rebound several times over the centuries. So today it's a little bit of a reconstruction effort to showing what the original you know, um, they they didn't they didn't number the pages one two three four five six all the way to the end, right? So it's going. Some of the historians have had to go on back and try to reconstruct what the original um, order of the pages would have been. One of the most elaborate and famous of these cover pages was this um, this Cairo from Folio thirty four R that you see here. The Cairo being the ancient Christograms using the Greek X and P, that is the first letters of Christ's name in Greek, superimposed. This image here illustrates yet another challenge that is often that it is often hard, if not impossible, on some of these pages to see or make out the letters the artist was decorating. Sometimes it's like a puzzle. You know, I can imagine some of you looking at this and struggling to make out the Chi and Rho which also touches on the fact that there are many scribal errors in the scripts. It's not, surpri it's not surprising that that happens. I mean, the um, historical criticism and biblical scholarship are well aware of scribal errors. There's a surprising amount, though, in the um, Book of Kells. But the monks of this period were themselves well aware of some of the difficulties, not only of accurately of accurate transcription, but also exegesis. And the images may have played a role in helping the monk in prayer transcend the challenges. As we see um, St. Columcell himself relating once that after a long period of scriptural meditation, he said that, quote, 
everything in sacred scripture that is dark and difficult came to light and was more plain to him after meditating upon certain images. And I'm just gonna, for, I do this for a few examples, but just gonna draw in here and just give you some details. This, this is just an astonishing piece. This particular folio is stunning in its complexity. I want you to keep in mind here on the left, remember the um, motif of these circular disc-like images, because that's going to take, uh, we'll discuss that here in a little bit later, and just the elaborate intricacy of the interweaving, that that Celtic knots that are so famous, If you and if you look on the right, I, I kind of love that they, they throw these in every once in a while, right? You have the sort of spiral image, and the spiral terminates with the head of a man. It's there's there's so much of this that's just embedded in these pages and you would really just could almost spend a lifetime looking and studying and finding different things. One of the things that lends itself to seeing these as being used in prayer is an example like this. This is a cropped view of folio 200 R. And it is the genealogy of Christ taken from the Gospel of Luke chapter 3. Now, if you ask me, I see this as almost having a chant quality to it. As, it, as if the viewer's mind is to be drawn into the mystery of Christ's familial history, not just to be read, but to be praised. And I, I don't know about you, but if you look at this, right, if you look at the, the various lines, I could almost see a monk like sitting down enchanting this and this becoming sort of a type of mental prayer though this is my own conjecture as a historian we see a few examples of the um symbols of the four evangelists and this 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 to me gets at the anachronistic desire from some to make the celts this group that was broken off from the main body of Christianity and attempts to break it off from Rome in particular, but from Orthodox belief in general. But besides the fact that they were using the Latin Vulgates, we also see that they make use here of the same symbolism. I mean, Matthew is represented by the man, Mark by the lion, Luke by the calf, John by the eagle. This is a common theme that you would find. And it's, as far as I remember, I believe it goes back at least as far as St. Irenaeus, who makes reference of this. And again, I just want to draw your attention to some of the detail, to some of the brilliant colors. I mean, look look at the detail of the colors on um, St. John and the eagle's wings. It's just, it's just a phenomenal piece. And as you can see here, like, I use this image because you get, it's a little bit duller. You don't quite get the, the color of the image, but you can get some of the details. But this image, just it's just the vibrancy of the colors. But you may miss some of the details just that, that just, a explosion of sensory stimulation here and i mean i could just imagine what it must have been like to have been a part of the process of drawing this here is the um introduction page to saint matthew's gospel and just a few things to just draw your attention to you know just notice that saint matthew himself he's standing as he holds the gospel in one hand and though he's standing behind him is a chair the arms of which depict the symbols of his fellow evangel evangelists. And he is framed in this common twisted snake imagery that we see uh, very common in the Book of Kells. Here we have St. John from the introduction page to his gospel. And following this theme of having the... Um, the person that they're depicting staring back at you, this, this, with this almost like a very haunting look. He holds a quill and gospel in his hand, and he is seated in this wide leg posture. The hands and feet and hallowed head of another figure are at the center and outer edges of the frame. It's believed to, that this was possibly to be a representation of God embracing the cosmos. Dr. Weiner, though, uh, Dr. Werner believed that it was um, intended to be the crucified Christ. And this is one of the most famous um, of all the pages of the Book of Kells. And you can, I mean, you can just kind of see why, just 
again, I pull in just some of the, you know, it's, it's hard to sacrifice some of the details to this one too, just to give you some of the color, but the, the details, just look at the halo around um, St. John's head. It's just a wonderful, wonderful. And then of course, just that brilliant um, Celtic knots there that, that just sort of interlace and wind into one another. Here we see the opening words of the Gospel of Mark. Again, I draw your attention to the challenge, which is to make out the words. You know, I, I have done the work here to point them out to you with some of the arrows just to make them easier to spot. But you can see one of the things that the artist would do is he would break the words apart. So you wouldn't finish a word in one line. You would have, you know, maybe three or four of the letters, it would break and then drop down to another place. So the, the eye of the viewers just sort of had to just be drawn across the entire image. Now we begin to look at some of the images of Jesus Christ himself. This is uh, from Folio 32V. And the artist certainly wants to make sure that the viewer is left with no doubt who they are looking at. Uh, as you can see, he's crowned at the top of his head with the cross. He is surrounded by angels. His head is flanked by peacocks that are stepping on and out of chalices, chalices which are overflowing with vines. And if you can um, notice on the wings of the peacocks, there is a disc to um, symbolize and represent the, the Eucharist. And again, there's just this this looking back out at you, and that sort of drawing you in whatever their whatever their intentions would be. Um, I always I always am drawn to that to that image of the person staring back out at us. Here we have the Madonna and Child, one of the most famous and my personal favorite. The image here, a Virgin and Child. It's it's a wonderful example of the unique iconography of this Celtic tradition, which again, uses motives and symbols that you could find in the greater Christian world, but done in this style that is proper to the people of Hibernia. Now, admittedly, this, this, this icon takes a viewer that may be used to Greek iconography a minute to warm to, as it is strikingly different. <laughs> I know, I know in Greek iconography, they have their own very specific rules of how to do icons, some, some bordering on a almost uh, xenophobic tendency to condemn any style that breaks from the Greco style, yet this was the style being used by Christians that were in communion with Greeks in the first millennium. So no one can claim that this is some late Western innovation. It just follows what we in the West would call enculturation. It takes the style and talents of the native people and lets them express the universal Catholic faith in a way that's their own. Now, when I first showed this image to my wife, she made kind of a uh, what in the world face. <laughs> and, and I mean, it does take a moment to warm up to how they portray the virgin and child. Uh, the, the the nose in particular, and it almost looks like the face of the young um, child, Christ child, is wearing, it, I don't think it's a mask. I'm not for sure what exactly the line is supposed to represent, though. But just keep in mind that to their eyes, to the eyes of the people that drew this, this was a sacred representation. It was in no way being flippant or disrespectful. And once you open to it, it really does begin to grow on you. Here we have Christ's temptation in the desert. You can see him atop of this triangular imagery with um, crowds of people and um, his head is flanked by almost almost lifted by angels. And then to his left, you can see um, Saint in there te tempting him. Here we have Folio 114R, the arrest of Christ. Again, I would point you first to the haunting gaze that just seems to leap out of the page. Christ, as he is being taken, stares directly at you, almost as if to invite you in to meditate on the events. In a way, not unlike one does when reciting the rosary. 
using imagery to help the prayers become both effective and unitive. We believe that the uh, Book of Kells was unfinished and that some of the um, blank pages were intended to depict the crucifixion and resurrection. And unfortunately, we never got those. But just here on this on this final image of Christ, Dr. O'Reilly's work uh, points out that there are many Eucharistic symbols in this image. For example, Christ's head, his hair, if you look, seems to seems to um, follow a olive vine motif, which depicts Jesus Christ as the Christ, the anointed one. And the vines, as you see, they move upwards and they wrap around the passage, which refers to Christ going to the Mount of Olives with his disciples. His hands are open in that way, yet he's being taken. His hands are open in that in that way that we see Christ represented sometimes, but he's also being taken by the um, uh, by the Roman guards, and there's a um, really really wonderful intricate columns that surround him that come together at a um, at, at at a peak together with two lions' heads that meet together and the lion's heads it almost looks like the tongues of the lion's heads are knotted together. Here, we're just going to look at some of the symbols of Christ that you will find on any given pages. And on the, on the left, um, you kind of have to adjust your eyes a little bit, but what these are, are they are elongated and spiral twisted images of the lion, right? The lion of Christ is the lion of the tribe of Judah. As well, with the center image, um, the full page I have in the says the center image, and then I crop it and make give you a detail of it to the far right, which is again these very intricate images of the of the lion. So here we have just a few symbols of Christ. On the image to the left here, it's it's hard to see, but in inside of the four discs are um, peacocks that are sort of wrapped around these knotted image these these um, images of the knots. The the peacock is a very ancient image of Christ. The, the the disc as well. We'll come back to that again. On the right here, we have images of a dove. As well, you will find very often in some of the pages um images of the cross and it's some sometimes you have to sort of look and spot it i mean obviously clearly here with this this is probably an introduction page to something um you get this very very ornate does cross design as well if you were to go back to the image of madonna and child you can see mary's head is haloed with images of the cross and you will find the cross throughout throughout the book of kells you also have some very clear and distinct Eucharistic symbolism. I've been hinting at it, but the it's believed that the discs that you see on many different pages in many different ways are examples and representations or symbols of the Eucharist. And as well, you will find specific examples of, um, and I'm not quite for sure, what the idea of representing the animal eating the Eucharist, but, and I couldn't get a clear detail of it, but I zoomed in to the sort of center right of this image, and you can see here it's a lion that is um, eating the Eucharist. You will find that in some, in some of the other various images, like, uh, I'll come back to it again, but here we have a genealogy, and if you zoom in on the genealogy, there is a man drinking from the chalice, so clear Eucharistic symbolism there. Here we have, they believe that these might even be mice or rats. And here you have a rat that looks like he's running off with the Eucharist. So I'm not quite for sure what that's all about. The medieval people were a little, little on the wild side and they had very, um, very, very active imaginations. As you can imagine, this was the days before internet and cable TV, which dulls all of our imaginations. They also, this is an example here, you will see that they are surrounded by these red dots. This is a specific thing that you will find in this um, 
in this era of of art and script of of using that of using that red dot i think i have a few more examples of that throughout here is a page um i didn't note to which page this is from this is probably from one of the gospels but if you zoom in you will find examples of at various points grapes and grapes were symbols of of course the chalice in the blood of christ Now here, I just wanted to give you just another, I mean, I just like looking at the pages. So I wanted to give you another example. And you will often find in some of these um, very elaborate ornate pages on the center moving down a little bit, you will see it's a cluster of men sort of scrunched in um, around, maybe that is a letter. It's hard to see. Yeah, I think it's an H and an I or an L and maybe an M. And then on the sort of center top, moving to the right a little bit, I zoomed in, I gave you a detail, and it's these, it's these men sitting there and their legs and arms are sort of knotted together and interlaced. And it's a little bit difficult to see, but they are pulling on each other's beards. So a little odd. We don't, I don't quite have any reason for why they would be doing that, but maybe it's just to an excuse to draw people and interlace them together. We have many examples of animals and I love medieval representations of animals because they're absolutely insane. Uh, on the top images, we have cats. On the bottom left, I have read that that are two hairs, um, but I believe it might be a cat or a dog that is chasing or attacking a hare that's trying to get away, but I could be wrong. You also have a man and a horse, and I could have just picked many more examples. Animals are just absolutely littered all throughout, and these are just sort of um, minor examples of animals. The, the major examples would be, of course, like the lion or the peacock, the representations of Christ or the representations of the evangelist, but we also have these, these minor images of animals all throughout. So, the scribes and the artists, and I just want to I want to touch upon them just for a minute here, because this comes from a day when the artist was not seeking personal recognition. The idea of the cult of the art artist doesn't really begin until Van Eyck's many centuries later with the beginning of the Renaissance, but uh, of Francois Henry has identified three distinct artists. Um, with at least the artists scribes now we believe that there are multiple scribes whose hands are on the on the um pages in many different places but she has identified three very distinct ones that she calls scribe a scribe b and scribe c and i give an example here of scribe a because a is an example uh this is folio 108 v and you can see that he has a very conservative hand it's not really given to a lot of embellishment and we find numerous examples of his uh, very sober hand all throughout the book of kells and you can see i mean i'm just astonished at the way in which they line up and I mean, it would just be, I mean, the, the, the amount of talent that these people had is just mind blowing because I would make 100 mistakes before I got to the end of this. And, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not an untalented artist by any stretch of the imagination, but the, the skill and the amounts of discipline it would take to come up with a single page like this, it's it's almost hard for me even to express to you. I mean, you're talking hours and hours and hours and hours of training and discipline to get to where you could do something like this. But he, of course, I mean, this is a very conservative page in the grand scheme of the Book of Kells, uh, Book of Kells, as opposed to artists that she calls Scribe B. And Scribe B, on the other hand, was given to a very elaborate style, and not only that, he also adds passages of scripture in places outside of where they're found in the text. And this, this is just really probably an example of a medieval cross-referencing of scriptural passages. 
And I believe, I didn't write which folio this is, but I believe that this is actually an example of it where the, where the top half is a one passage and the bottom half is a second passage. So it would just be, you know, you would be drawing attention to this place in scripture and then referencing it to this other place in scripture to show sort of the unifying theme of things. And that's kind of what I want to end on here because we've really lost in this day and age of the printing press what the medieval mind was thinking. And so much of the Reformation and even a little bit of the Counter-Reformation was reactionary against the medieval world. But while I do not at all deny that there were excesses in the medieval world, there certainly were. There's also just this wonderful way in which the transcendent was involved in how the everyday Catholic lived their lives. And the monastics at that time, right, they could easily have just written scripture and written the word and put it down on the page. But they saw themselves as doing something much more powerful and much more both heavenly and human in this way in which they brought the script together with this very elaborate imagery. And it shows how they viewed scripture as not just this process where you sit down and wrote memorized passages. You actually enter into it. You enter into this world where the visual is, 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 brings to life and it's like the the fruit of the vine of the written word now the very last thing i wanted to do here is i just i i love this and this is what i'm going to end on just because it's kind of silly but this is where a scribe actually did make a mistake and it's somebody if i had to guess it's probably a second hand comes in and corrects the scribe. <laughs> so this is actually the cor a, a correction because they actually did make mistakes because these were human beings and mistakes were, you know, we, we, we are given to mistakes as we're transcribing certain things. And I don't blame them at all, but I actually, I just love this, that there is, this is a, this is a detail. This is a zoom in on one of the pages where this second scribe comes and is, uh, I, I found your mistake and he, and he corrects it. So I just wanted to end with that because I love it. But anyways, this is the Book of Kells, and if you hadn't heard about it before, you have heard about it now, and I would recommend, I mean, I, I don't have any references to any particular books that you could buy on it in particular, but make sure if you buy a book on the Book of Kells that it's, you, you kind of want it to be on like a gloss paper because you want the page to come alive, right? You want to see it as it was intended to be seen, and Honestly, I would get it. I would make sure, too, that it's of a significant size paper, too. So you're not like you having to use a magnifying glass to look at the details of it, because you want to like when you look at something like the Book of Kells, you want it to come to life and to be full. You, as you can experience as the way that the monks would have experienced it when they were looking at it. So that's what I got, guys. That's it. I hope you enjoyed this. If you did, like and subscribe, and I will see you guys next time. Take care.